All right, let's get underway. Open your Bibles to Paul's letter to the Romans, please. Okay, first I've been asked if I would make an announcement for you, uh, to you, uh, on behalf of our youth. One is uh, on behalf of the chapel choir. On uh, even years, their choir tour is a little farther. On odd-numbered years, they don't go quite as far away. So last year uh, was an odd-numbered year, of course, and they just went to parts of Oklahoma and Texas. But this being an even-numbered year, they are going to Canada uh, in June to sing there. And even though they have funds and all parents who can pay uh, do pay, uh, young people are not embarrassed if, if we have uh, knowledge that their parents cannot pay. They, we do have some uh, people who are making possible that trip for those who cannot pay. And for some, uh, every time they take one of the longer trips, we have young people who have never been on an airplane before. Now, that may surprise some of you, but Boston Avenue really covers the gamut here. Uh, we have, of course, some, some children and youth whose parents can take them all kinds of places, but we have other youth here who have not been very far, not very many places, and whose parents simply do not have that kind of money. Uh, they may be living with a single parent or whatever, that makes that uh, impossible for them. So this is really a, a great experience for them. Uh, you may recall that two years ago, their last big trip, they went to New York City and they got to sing at uh, Rabbi Zimmerman's congregation up in the Hamptons as a part of that trip. And they got to see some museums and things that uh, virtually none of them had seen before. But again, for some, it was the first time they'd ever been on an airplane. So... Here's the, here's the point. This Friday night, uh, they're going to be presenting their musical curtains. And next Sunday afternoon at 2, they're presenting the musical curtains. Last time they did one of these, they simply asked if there were people in the congregation who like to bake or are willing to bake, who would make a cake or a batch of cookies or whatever that they could use in a silent auction. And the people who come to the play uh, can walk around and look at the desserts and write down, you know, a bid. And, of course, everybody who bids knows that they're paying more than the cake is worth, more than the pie is worth in some sense. But it, it helps the kids who don't have the money to go on the trip to go. And their names are not made known to the other youth and so on. It's, it's anonymously done. So if you were a cook and would be interested in doing that, uh, they're going to have two different bakings, if you would. So the things that are auctioned off Friday night, people will take home with them. And then other baked goods will be here Sunday afternoon at 2 next week. So this is a sign-up sheet if you think you would like to do that. The other thing is that our youth, some of them in the choir, some not in the choir, uh, also do various mission projects during the year. Uh, that we can't always budget for out of the offerings, the, the plate offerings. So Audra uh, Fogel and Debbie Peterson asked a few years ago if we could have a program here called Take Stock in Our Youth, and you get a certificate and so on that you are a shareholder in the youth activities, and this makes it possible. Last Christmas, for example, they took their Christmas break uh, the week between Christmas and New Year's and went to New Orleans and worked in the Katrina area. We have United Methodist still working there uh, in rebuilding efforts, and we had a big group of senior high youth. Again, we always have some parents who can pay the load, and we have uh, other young people, very active, giving much of themselves, who simply don't come from families who are financially able to do that. So I know we're hitting you almost every Sunday. I told the staff, gosh, we're hitting our people almost every Sunday. There's no compulsion. If you want to do either one of those, fine. If, if you don't, that's fine as well. Okay, open your Bibles with me to Romans 4. 
If you're new with us, let me uh, bring you up to date here best we can. We are told by Paul that he has not yet been to Rome when he wrote this letter. Uh, it is the first of his letters that we have in the Bible, but I've told you it's not the oldest material we have from Paul. His letters are not in chronological order. Scholars are agreed on that. But probably the oldest material we have in the New Testament, certainly not the Gospels, probably Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. Scholars are pretty much agreed on that, that the, the letter to the Thessalonian church, Thessalonica, you remember, it was right up in northernmost Greece. It was, it was called Macedonia in biblical times. And uh, Thessalonica is right there on the famous Roman road uh, called the Via Ignatia. He went to Philippi, then Thessalonica, then Berea, then down to Athens and so on. His writing back to the church at Thessalonica, we believe, the oldest thing we have. He does get to Rome. If you were here when we went through Luke's second book, Acts of the Holy Spirit, you recall that he took us on a very lengthy uh, journey all the way to Rome, lengthy in the way he described it. And that last journey of Paul, he came across on the southernmost part of the island of Crete, across to Malta, uh, landed at Syracuse in, in Sicily and then up to Regium, right on the toe of the boot, the Italian boot, and then caught a ship on up to uh, Puteoli. It's called in the Bible, it's now called Naples, and uh, Pompeii, right there, and then from there, just immediately on north to Rome. He had not been there when he wrote this letter. He tells us he's not been there yet, so he's writing to people he does not know, where in the case of the Thessalonian letter and the Corinthian letters and so on, he's writing to people that he does know, churches that he has established. So where and when did he have the time to write this longest letter of his that we know about? There are probably three candidates. One is we know that he spent more than a year in Corinth. Most scholars believe he didn't write this letter that early in his missionary journeys. They think a more likely candidate would be Ephesus, where he went after Corinth, and we are told that he was more than two years in Ephesus. He certainly would have had time to write the letter from Ephesus to Rome. Ephesus is modern-day Turkey. This is Asia Minor. The other likely candidate would be Caesarea Maritima, or Caesarea on the, on the sea, uh, where Pontius Pilate, of course, had lived uh, when Jesus was living. Uh, Pilate has been dismissed, discharged from his duties by the time Paul is there. Paul is confined for more than two years at Caesarea Maritima, appealing his case to Rome because he's a Roman citizen. So he might have written from Caesarea. He might have written from Ephesus. Could have written from Corinth, but not as likely. Okay, so he's writing to people whom he does not know. He's only heard about. Uh, this is probably not a big church not building at all, group, group of people to whom he writes. But the letter gets circulated and it gets preserved. And we have it 2,000 years later, this very significant letter. Okay, let's pray. We'll get underway. God, thank you for Paul. We know he was a flawed messenger in many ways. He admits to that. Yet we learn much from his struggles we're amazed by his courage, by his willingness to hang in there in the worst of times and continue to be a voice for hope and courage and faith who would write to the church at Corinth that the greatest things we know are faith and hope and love. And the greatest of those three is agape a willingness to put ourselves out for the well-being of another as you, O oh God, put yourself out in the giving of your Son, Jesus. We promise our best effort in your holy name. Amen. All right. Paul has been writing in chapter 3 words that Martin Luther will pick up on 1,500 years later and shout out both from the pulpit in the little town of Wittenberg, Germany, even more effectively in his writings, Sola Fide, Sola Grazia. Uh, 
it is sola gratia, that is, only grace, God's unmerited, unfavored love. I mean by that that we don't have to do anything to earn. God already loves us. One as much as the other, one no more than the other. And if we believe that we are so loved of God that we open the door when he knocks, our faith makes that grace possible for us. There must be a response to it, a no or a yes. So, sola gratia, sola fide. That is, grace alone through faith alone. We come in faith that this is the truth. God does love us no matter what. And we accept his gift. But we also talked about having accepted his gift, how we are then supposed to be changed by his gift. That his grace changes our behavior. Okay, so if it's just about grace and faith, then what in the world does Abraham have to do with all of this? And the reason Abraham becomes a significant player is, of course, that he and Sarah founded the Jewish community. Those of you who have been through the whole Bible with us know that the Jews count their history back to Abraham and Sarah. That the 11 chapters of Genesis that are before Abraham and Sarah are for Jews a prehistory. Their attempt to try to describe how the world got into such a mess that it was when Abraham and Sarah came along in a little community called Ur in the Chaldean Mountains in what is modern day Iraq. And how did this old man and old woman who'd been trying all their adult lives to have a baby without success would become the mother and father of Judaism? That is Israel's long history. And every time it's recounted, it starts with Abraham and Sarah and Abraham and Sarah. And now he says, so what about all of these Gentiles? He's writing to people who've been pagans and heathen in Rome who've come to faith in God through Christ. What is Abraham and all that the Jewish community became from Abraham and Sarah? What's that got to do with Gentiles? That's the argument here. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? And by our, of course, he means Jews. Uh, his ancestors and any others in Rome who've become Christian who were first Jews. Uh, what, what does Abraham and, and Sarah, of course, along with him mean to us? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? And Scripture, of course, to Paul would have been the Hebrew Scriptures. There were no Christian Scriptures yet. None. The four Gospels had not been written. Paul never considered himself to be writing Scripture. He was just writing letters. To one church he had never met, most of the time to churches he knew very well. But letters, not scripture. So when he says scripture, he means the 39 scrolls of the Hebrew Bible. All right. What does the scripture say? And then he tells you, Abraham believed God. And Abraham lived before Moses got the name at the burning bush. So this is the older name for God, El or Elohim. It's translated into Greek, of course, as Theos, Abraham believed Elohim and it, that is, his believing, the, pre the antecedent of it here is actually the verb, if you would, or if you want to say a noun, it's Abraham's belief. Abraham's belief was counted to him as righteousness. Now remember, righteousness means right standing. Okay. So what that means is, did Abraham and Sarah stand right with God because they rolled up their bed and packed up their tent and started going where God said? Or were they counted right with God by the fact that they trusted him enough to start doing what they do? Let me go back farther. What is sin? If you look in a big, fat, unabridged dictionary like Gail bought me many years ago, which I have in my office and still use almost weekly for one thing or another, 
If you look up sin, most often it will say, first definition, transgression. And you know that that comes from Latin. Trans means across, always. Garaseri here has to cut across. You cut across the will of God. Okay, is that sin? If it does, if it is, then that would mean picking the apple. If you go back to the wonderful paradiso, the garden. But see, when you really come down to what is sin, one of my professors kept saying, but what had to happen before they picked that fruit? What had to happen? God said, I'm giving you this beautiful place. Enjoy. I'm giving this to you. Oh, there is one tree right over there. Don't have fool with that one. If you eat off that tree, you will die. And along came a talking snake and said, What a beautiful place you have here. I guess you could just eat about everything here. Well, not off that tree. Why not? Because God said we would die. Notice in Dr. Brandon Scott, when he gave our Barton Clinton Gordy series a few years ago, he said the root word for the Satan is the liar. The snake accuses God of being the liar. He says, really? The truth is, if you eat off that tree, you will live as long as God and be as wise as God. Oh, really? Then I'm having some of that. So see, my professor said, so before they picked and ate, they didn't trust God. They trusted the snake. Okay? So, he insisted in his class, if you're going to define sin... You're going to define it as unfaith. That may seem a strange word. Unfaith or not trusting. Faith, I mean sin, is not trusting. If you trust, then it would follow you do what you've been told. If you don't trust, then sky's the limit. See? Okay. So with Abraham and Sarah. Are they counted right Because they rolled up the bed, packed up the tent, and started moving westward? Or were they counted right because they trusted what God was saying? I'm going to give you a baby. Come with me. Okay. And the Bible is very clear. Sarah was not morning sick the next day, nor the next month, nor the next year. So the Bible wants you to understand they are moving only by faith at this point. This baby has not come, is not yet on the way as far as they can tell. Years pass. Okay. Now it's interesting to me that our two rabbis in Tulsa are a little different on this point. I've been in one Jewish Christian dialogue group here in Tulsa almost 30 years. And Rabbi Fitzerman, as you know, is at B'nai Imuna Synagogue, and they are conservative. And Charles Sherman is at Temple Israel, and he is Reformed Jew. Okay. Charles Sherman at the Reformed Temple has no trouble talking about grace. It's a word he's comfortable with. But every time in our discussion when Fitzerman's present that you mention grace, he will quickly say, wait, 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 wait. That's your word. That's not our word. And in one sense, he's right. Uh, grace as we have it comes from charis in Greek, or charisma, from which we get it means gifted, literally gifted. Um, if you're gifted and you receive the gift, that's the idea in Greek. But he keeps saying we don't really have a Hebrew word that's translated perfectly as grace. Okay. One time, you know, knowing Paul's writings fairly well, I said, but now, Rabbi, when Abraham and Sarah rolled up their beds and packed up the tent and started moving out the next morning, wasn't that because they trusted the promise God had made? And his answer was, no, God chose them because he knew they would do the right thing. Okay. So, here Rabbi Fitzerman would not follow Paul's writing at all. He wouldn't buy this. I think Charles Sherman would buy this, that... Before they moved and acted, they trusted. Okay? That's Paul's argument here. Before they did anything else, they had to believe 
that what God was telling them was true. And that's called trust. Trust. And trust is a synonym for faith. Okay. Uh, Verse 4. Now to one who works, that is, if you're going to try to make your way by things you can do, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. Okay, so as simply as we can say it, Paul believes that there is only one way to stand right with God. You receive God's gift of acceptance. That's it. Only way you can stand right with God, you receive God's gift that he accepts you as his child. I tell our young people when they're coming to confirmation that as I place my hand on your head and and I pray that you may be confirmed in the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ, up in the ceiling, Dr. Pensera is going to strike, you know, the chime. Bong! The same chime that she sounds every time we come to the prayer of consecration and communion. This is my body. Take, eat in remembrance of me. Bong. This is my blood. Drink given for you and many for the forgiveness of sin. This chime that we instituted after I came here, which has been used for centuries in Eastern Orthodoxy and in quite a few Catholic churches, often a little bell sounded down at the altar. The one who was crucified has come to the table. The one who was crucified has come to the table. He's been raised. Okay, so I say to our confirmands, we sound this same chime because it's Paul who says in one of his letters, the Holy Spirit stands ready to whisper to our spirit that we are children of God. And I said, this whole church is praying as the chime sounds that in your deepest heart you are hearing God say, Oh, Sarah, I know you. You are my daughter. I'm so glad you've taken this next big step in your walk with me. Okay. It's a gift. Will you receive God's gift? That he accepts you. You are my daughter. You are my son. I'm so glad you've come home to me. Let's skip to verse 9. Is this blessedness then pronounced only on the circumcised or also on the uncircumcised? All right, here we come to the grist of the thing. Paul is anticipating what he's run into everywhere he's been. And we will see this really hammered out in his letter to the Galatians. Everywhere he goes, these so-called Judaizers are right behind him. And all he means by that is people who are convinced that these Gentiles ought not to get into the community of faith in the one true God without getting in the way they got in. And I've told you how significant it was that three things at least be kept all through the Babylonian captivity. You really have to go back to there to understand just how ingrained this was within them. You see, there have been several times in Jews' history where they were threatened with annihilation. The Holocaust, certainly the most recent one, that six and a half million Jews died. That was a huge percent of their population. What if we should cease to be Jews? You see, it had happened already to the ten northern tribes. They ceased to be Jews. When the Assyrians overran them in 721, before the Common Era, they were so raped, plundered, intermarried, displaced. I mean, they were literally forced marched out of their homes and cities and farms. And Assyrians were marched in and took over. They became such a mixed-blooded people that through history the Jews called them the lost tribes, the ten lost tribes. So when the Babylonians came to the very walls of Jerusalem, breached those walls, and took all the valuables out of the palace and out of the temple on the top of the Temple Mount and set fire to both of them, gouged out the eyes of the king after killing all of his children in front of them so in front of him so that he could see you have no more heirs he's led away an older blind man to Babylon 
Can you imagine then how concerned the priests are who are being force marched? What they're talking about as they trudge along all the way from Jerusalem to what is today modern day Iraq? How can we keep being Jews? How can we be Jews? How can we not become Babylonian? And they decided on three things. Now they wanted people to keep all the commandments. They wanted them to do all of Torah, but at least three. Circumcise all little, our little boys on the eighth day of their lives. Everybody eat kosher and everybody shut down everything. Sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, the Sabbath. Okay. So, for 600 years, they've been trying hard, desperately, to get that done. And now Paul is supposedly taking people in to the family of faith and telling them they don't have to do these things. They don't have to do them. You see why they were trailing him, following him everywhere he went? Judaizers saying, you can't do this. All these males coming into the community have to be circumcised. These people cannot eat flesh that's been offered up at pagan shrines and then sold in the market. Can't do that. Paul's telling them they can. They don't have to be circumcised for religious purposes. They can't eat meat that's now sold in the public markets that were just down the block being offered up, the entrails and so on, to the pagan gods before. That's what the argument's all about here. So, <clears throat> is this blessedness then pronounced only on the circumcised or also on the uncircumcised? We say, faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it reckoned to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? And he knows very well the scroll of Genesis. He's heard it read every year of his life. If you go to the temple or one of the synagogues every Friday night for a whole year, you will hear the five first scrolls the Torah read through every year. He's heard this, he's heard this, he's heard this. Abraham and Sarah rolled up their bed, packed up their tent, and moved 500 miles. No baby, no circumcision yet. Okay? He knows. He's right about that. So it was not after he was circumcised that he had faith, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Okay, the seal, the circumcision, had meaning for the Jewish community as a sign of faith. But faith came first. And we say of our baptism, which is our sign, when we baptize babies, when we baptize adults, as we did on Easter Sunday, uh, adult. Uh, when, when we baptize anyone, we say this is the rite, R-I-T-E, the rite of initiation by which we are welcomed into the community of faith. If a person's old enough to have faith on, on her own part, his own part, and we ask them if they do before we baptize them. If it's the case of an infant... We are very clear in asking the parents and the faith community, will you keep this child under the ministry and guidance of the church until he or she shall embrace this faith as this child's very own? Okay? So expressing the faith is very important. Baptism is a symbol of being received into the faith community. Okay, the purpose was to make him, Abraham, the ancestor of all who believe <coughs> without being circumcised, and to thus and to thus have righteousness reckoned to them. Reckon means given. It's in this case, righteousness is given. God's gift of grace. Will you receive His gift? Then you're set right with God. And likewise, the ancestor of the circumcised, who are not only circumcised but who also follow the example of the faith that our ancestor Abraham had before he was circumcised. So even if we circumcise our little boys, he's saying, at eight, eight days of age, they must be taught. And they come to bar mitzvah, at which time they say, 
the faith of my mother and father has become my faith. Very much, I mean, our confirmation in Christianity came as a follow-up to what Jews were doing. We so thought, this, this is a good thing they're doing. We need to do something similar for our Christians. Okay. Okay, let's go on. Verse 13. Everybody's okay, right? You're following along here. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the Torah, but through the right standing of faith. Now, by Torah here, he means, first of all, he knows it hadn't been written yet. There was no Torah when Abraham and Sarah came to faith in the one true God. Uh, Torah came a long time later. So he didn't come to right standing with God through Torah. And for Paul, Torah means basically things we're supposed to do and things we're supposed not to do. Okay. Okay. So the Torah is about doing. It's also about faith, of course, because Abraham and Sarah are in the Torah later, just not at the time they lived. They would become key players in the Torah later. But he's trying to get the point. Is it something you do or something you receive? That's his main point. If it is the inheritance, adheritance of Torah who are to be heirs, then faith is no, the promise is void. Okay. The promise to Abraham and Sarah was a baby, a son no less, who had found a new community of faith. That was the promise. But if it was something they made happen, why hadn't they made it happen 30 years before? It wasn't something they made happen. It was something God made to happen that they became parents. First was the gift and the receiving of the gift, the promise. That was first. For me, the Torah brings wrath. But where there is no Torah, neither is there violation. Uh, for this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace. See, here Paul uses this word, seems very comfortable with it, as Rabbi Sherman seems comfortable using the word grace, and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the inheritance of Torah, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. Okay, now he's coming back to Gentiles. They don't have Abraham and Sarah's genes. If you tested their DNA, they're not descendants of Abraham and Sarah by genetic uh, data. Then it goes on to say, For he is the father of us all, Abraham. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. And we know that Matthew's gospel ends by saying, Go ye to all the ethnics, literally, all the non-Jews, teaching, preaching, baptizing, and so on. So if God is the father of all the nations, not just the Jewish one, uh, then it must have been about the promise, the promise of a child, the promise of God's leading them. And you know what God finally says to them, of course, Abraham and Sarah, get on with it. I will be with you. That's the promise. I will be with you. And he is with them, of course. Okay. Um, Okay, we've just had the parenthetical expression. For he is the father of all of us. That is written, I've made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed. Okay, here again we have uh, not the Lord, the name given at the burning bush, but the name before the burning bush, the one true God. In the presence of the God in whom Abraham believed, who gives life to the dead. Paul can say now for sure because... Jesus has been raised and calls into existence the things that do not exist yet. I mean, there was no baby. There was no pregnancy. Only a promise at that point. Hoping against hope. Abraham, that is. He's still talking about Abraham. Hoping against hope. I mean, he and Sarah have been trying this forever. And it hasn't worked. Yet God is asking them, hope one more time. Trust one more time. And they must have tried a number of more times because months pass, months pass, still no baby. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what was said. That is, he heard God say to him, so numerous shall your descendants be. 
He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead. Paul says he is about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. I mean, if he just looked at all the data, he would have to say, well, there's not a chance. No chance. No distrust. See, the opposite of trust. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. And glory means shine light on. Shine the light on God, what God has said he would do. And then notice verse 21. Being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Here again, he's building the case for faith. Not something Abraham did. Not something Sarah did. Abraham didn't believe he could make a baby. He'd been trying forever. Didn't believe Sarah could make a baby. She'd been trying forever. But maybe God could make a baby. In fact, it says, fully convinced God could do what he promised. Therefore, his faith, his trust, was reckoned to him as right standing. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. So what he's going to say is Abraham and Sarah became a model for us. Models for us. As they trusted that we too can trust that what God promises he can make happen. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Justification, again, means being set right. I told you it's a term used in accounting, where you make all the assets and the liabilities come out the same. So Paul is talking to these folks in Rome, whom he does not know. He's writing all of this to say to them, uh, the God of Abraham and Sarah, you've come to know more clearly than ever before in a person, Jesus. Okay? Flesh and blood person. But now he uses the word our Lord. It's the same word that we have in the mosaic on the south end of the great hall, the kurios. It is the corresponding Greek word for the Hebrew word in the mosaic at the north end of the hall. Name given at the burning bush, translated, the Lord. Eye asher eye, I am who I am. Or I will be who I will be. And the one I will be present in was Jesus of Nazareth. We believe that he was present in a flesh and blood person and we never had been before, never would be again, except in that one. Okay. Now that's a whole lot of stuff, that fourth chapter. You think you're pretty clear about that? This is, in many ways, this is the crux of the whole letter. It goes on and on and on, and we are too going to go on with his letter, but that's the heart of it right there. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. The, did you all hear the question is then, if Paul is so persuasive here, why did the Jews go back to the synagogue? Every year I go to Temple Israel for the clergy institute, they call it. Uh, a, a, a late uh, physician here in town, Dr. Lubin, who was in our Jewish Christian Dialogue group when we found it almost 30 years ago, who since has died, Dr. Lubin and his wife gave monies uh, to bring one of Judaism's greatest scholars to Tulsa, a different one every year. And uh, after they usually they spend time with the Jewish community Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, and then uh, they invite uh, Christians to come, Christian clergy, on Monday. And we hear a presentation, they feed us lunch, and we hear another presentation. Okay. They've had different messages. You know, I've been hearing them almost 30 years since Dr. Lubin founded the series. I mean, they talk about different things, but a number of them have talked to us Christians about why they don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. And the number one argument, he got crucified. He got crucified. That was the thing that, that Judaism could not get over the hump. Uh, 
No, Messiah was to bring the Messianic age where the lion lies down with the lamb and uh, where what Jesus was saying has come true. I mean, the meek inherit the earth and the peacemakers shall see God and that didn't happen, they say. It didn't happen. And so they talk about uh, Jesus being a good person and, and being honest and reputable and what he teaches is good. But... He wasn't the one or he wouldn't have been killed. That's the, that's the crux of it. Now, when Rabbi Sherman and I sit down with each other, and he's one of my favorite people in Tulsa, uh, he and Nancy both for Gail and me, uh, we don't try to convince each other about, on this point. I mean, we just don't talk about that because there's so much that we hold in common that we can talk about. Rabbi Sherman believes... Gail and I worship the same God that he and Nancy worship. I don't believe there's any doubt in his mind about that, that we worship the same God. He doesn't believe, I'm sure, though he would never try to convince me of this, for me, that God was somehow present in Jesus in a way he had not been in other people. I mean, that's not a part of his faith. Uh, and it's, it's the crux of mine, of course, that, that God was present in Jesus of Nazareth in a way he never had been before. Um, but I, I think very clearly uh, the reason they went back to the synagogue, uh, well, maybe there are two, maybe two. One, of, I believe the predominant one is that Messiah could not have been so horribly treated, crucified by the Romans. That's not the way they envisioned Messiah uh, as one crucified. And the other thing could have been that Paul, through his ministry and later his death and beyond his death, had really convinced a lot of people they didn't have to do circumcision for religious purposes. They didn't have to do circumcision. They didn't have to eat kosher and they didn't have to go to the synagogue on Friday night. And so the Jews, again, were very threatened that they might cease to be a separate people. And they were determined that was not going to happen. So they withdrew into their communities where they could insist upon it. We will circumcise our little boys. We will eat kosher. And we will uh, observe Sabbath. So that's why they went back to the synagogues. Yeah. And the gospel writers, of course, all four of them are writing into that period where the, Gen the, the Jews have basically gone back to the synagogue. And so in their writings, they know this is the big hurdle. And we'll see this again when we get to Paul's letter to the Corinthians. He talks about the stumbling block. And the stumbling block is that Jesus got crucified. The cross is it. Uh, they can't get over that, you know, can't get over that fact that Jesus got crucified. And so the gospel writers are trying, by telling the story the way they do, uh, in four slightly different ways, that you can find places in the Hebrew Scriptures that lead you to believe in a crucified Messiah. The gospel writers believe you can. And Paul believed that you could find places in the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, let me digress a second here. And I believe you can, of course. I believe you can find in the Hebrew Scriptures uh, passages of Scripture that allow for a crucified Messiah. And I would go back to one of the presentations that Rabbi Zimmerman made here just, to, just three years ago. I thought the best of his... I, I loved all four of his presentations. I thought he was terrific. The one I liked best of the four was where he traced through their Scriptures how the rejected son became the agent of reconciliation. If you were not here, let me remind you just briefly about that, because he spent nearly an hour. I will not do that. But he, he talked about the rejected son, and the first one he dealt with was Ishmael. Even though Abraham and Sarah had faith, that faith ran low. After several years, Sarah finally said, it's not working you're not fathering a child. And remember, they did not believe in life after death in Abraham and Sarah's time. They believed the only life you had was what continued in your children and grandchildren, period. So if you had no children and no grandchildren, you were in real mess. You were supposed to make babies. 
So <clears throat> Sarah comes to Abraham and says, it's not working. I'm not getting pregnant. I've got a handmaid here. If you're going to father a child, maybe it's going to have to be with Hagar. And so Abraham said, whatever you think, dear. And he went into Hagar and she got pregnant and Ishmael was born. And every indication is that the family was doing fine, enjoying little Ishmael until, boom, Sarah woke up nauseous one morning. And nine months later or so thereabouts, a baby was born. And Sarah did not want this other son in any way taking anything from her son. And she said to Abraham, get rid of them. And without a question, he did. He sent them out into the desert. And uh, the Bible says Hagar had no way to provide for herself and this son, and she could not bear to see him die for lack of food and water. And so she left him at one place and went away a little way just so she wouldn't have to watch him die. Did Abraham come looking for her? No. Did Sarah come looking for her? No. Who did? God did. The Bible says God came to Hagar. Because God still loved Hagar. She was one of his children. He loved Ishmael. He was one of his children. But then Zimmerman went on to say, after this crazy old man, Abraham, almost killed Isaac up there on the mountain that day, the Bible never says Isaac went home with him. In fact, it says when Abraham died, his sons came to bury him. And a rabbi standing right there said, I believe Isaac ran to his older brother and lived with him. The rejected son became the agent of reconciliation. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau. Esau born first. Birthright should have been his. Jacob was a liar and a thief. Lied to his father, stole from his brother. Ran. When his older brother said, I'm going to kill him. He ran. He was gone 20 years. Started home. Two wives, two handmaids, 12 little boys. And then he heard Esau's coming with 400 men. Scared to death. Wrestled all night with God. Crossed the Jabbok River limping because God had wrenched his hip out of joint. And when Esau got there, he jumped down off his horse and ran and threw his arms around Jacob. The rejected son became the agent of reconciliation. Zimmerman traced that generation after generation. Joseph was the beloved son. He was not the agent of reconciliation. He got them to Egypt, but as Brueggemann told you, he bought into the empire entirely. He started acting like an Egyptian. He was taking poor people's money, sending them off with very little. He became an Egyptian. The agent of reconciliation was the rejected son, not son of favored wife. There were only two of them, Joseph and Benjamin. It was not one of them who was the agent of reconciliation. It was Simeon who offered to stay in Egypt until my little brother gets safely home. Please, please don't hurt him. My old father would die. He's a rejected son. He's born of non-favored woman. Agent of reconciliation. Well, Zimmerman went all the way through to the Babylonian captivity and said the second writer in Isaiah saw this long history and said, so we Jews are the rejected people. We're the rejected children. We've been forced marched away to Babylon. We must become the reconciling agent for the world. Okay, I think that's what he had in mind. But I think 600 years later, God tried something different. The stone which the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The one who was crucified, I believe, became the reconciler of the world. And that's what Paul believed. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, reconciling us and the world to himself. Okay. So, I believe there are is room in the Hebrew Scriptures for a crucified Messiah. I believe there is. The rabbis would think not. Okay? That's where we differ. But we can always do like Rabbi uh, Martin Buber suggested. You remember that famous line. A Christian said to him one day, Well, 
you say the rabbi, the uh, Messiah is still coming and we say he's been here. And Dr. Buber said, why don't we work alongside each other to try to heal God's world? And when he gets here, we'll ask him, have you been here before? <laughs> okay. You and I believe he's been here before. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, did you all hear? If, if we Methodists believe that the word Torah more accurately means instructions or teaching, why did the very capable scholars who translated our Bible keep calling it law? And the reason is, uh, Stephen, they're not, they're not translating Torah. They're translating a Greek word, nomos, you see. Paul didn't write in Hebrew. He may have thought in Hebrew, but he wrote in Greek. And so for them to be honest with you about what Paul wrote, they use the correct translation of nomos, which is law. Uh, and, but I think, and, you know, and my professors believed that we do far more service to those five scrolls if we understand them to be the teachings or the instructions. And that is, uh, Torah itself really does mean teachings or instructions. The Greeks, well, the Greeks didn't have a, a good word. They didn't have a good word. Sometimes when you're working in another language, they simply don't have a word that, that works well. And so he used the word uh, nomos, and that in Greek really almost always means the law. So that's why it got translated that way into English. Yeah. Okay, we've run out of time. Uh, next week, the 29th, we will start at chapter 5. Remember, um, if you have to be away uh, for any reason next Sunday, after next Sunday's uh, services and all, uh, Gail and I will be leaving on vacation. But Dr. Kroll, who works with this age group uh, for us, has arranged for you to have two professors from Phillips Theological Seminary right here in the city. If you're not familiar with Phillips, they are a very fine, fully accredited seminary that belongs to the disciples, the, church of, uh, the, the Christian church. And uh, we have an endowed chair of uh, Wesleyan Studies at Phillips uh, Richard and Norma Small in our church gave the money, half the money for that. And Mr. Cadjo of Quick Trip, who's not a Methodist, he's a disciple, gave the other half. And, and so the professor who now holds that chair, uh, which they were kind enough to name uh, the Muzon Biggs Chair of Wesleyan Studies, will be here to teach you the following Sunday, May 6th. And then the following Sunday, Dr. Susan Southard, who is another professor at Phillips, will be here to teach you. So I'll, I'll just be away two Sundays, and they will do a great job for you on the 6th and the 13th of May. I'll be back on the 20th uh, with you. But I'll be here next Sunday. I'll see you next Sunday.